Good morning from Austin, Texas. On behalf of the NMC, I'm delighted to welcome you to the official release of the second Digital Literacy Strategic Brief. If you haven't already, please sure, be sure to download the report at go.nmc.org slash 2017-digilit. Let's, I'll go ahead and put, drop that into the chat so that you can make sure you have that available. Okay, great. I'm your host today, Alex Freeman. I'm joined by our um, Gordon Jackson from the NMC who's here to assist on technical support. If you're on Twitter, um, great, so are we. Our hashtag for today's event is NMCHC. That's NMCHC, and I'll go ahead and put that in there. I know that Cheryl has been active on there this morning already. Okay, let's get this program started. So now on to the moderator of today's program. We have an author, futurist, and founder of Brian Alexander Consulting. Uh, Brian Alexander, take it away. Good morning from the East Coast of the United States, everybody. I'm very, very glad to be here for all kinds of reasons. Uh, one is that I'm pleased to be seeing more work in digital literacy. Uh, second is I'm so glad to see so much interest with all kinds of participants here. And third, I'm especially delighted to be with a bunch of wonderful panelists from all over the world right now. Uh, here's our plan for the next hour. Uh, I'm going to begin by describing what this report is, how it was created, some of the major highlights and uh, findings. And then this esteemed panel is going to take turns, each of them giving their own comments, their own points of view about their contributions and what they see of digital literacy and uh, their particular perspectives. And then we're going to transition to a freewheeling conversation. I'm uh, prime the pump with some questions and comments from panelists that we want to hear from everybody here. We want to hear from people like uh, Michael Berman. We want to hear from Sarah. We want to hear from Liz. We want to hear from everybody who is involved because this is going to be a major, major conversation to have in the year of fake news, in the year of blockchain and virtual reality, in the year where more people are online than ever before. Digital literacy is possibly more important than it ever has been. Now, to begin, I'm going to get a little retro and shift over to a PowerPoint presentation. So I hope you forgive me for that act of uh, you know, almost 1990s level technology in order, and uh, let me uh, show you where things are. So to begin with, if you haven't had a chance to get the report, we put the link in the, slot, in the, uh, in the chat, but we have a, that should take you to the download so you can take a look at it. And in fact, you can multitask if you want and read that and listen to me and watch it with us at the same time. Let's see how far you can pull that off. But to begin with, you should know that uh, this is the second part of a major report series for the New Media Consortium. Uh, the first part came out last year when we did a digital literacy strategic brief. And this was a major uh, event in a lot of ways because it stirred up a lot of controversy uh, and got a lot of attention, in part because digital literacy is becoming even more important. Let me just flash back to that. That report included uh, an unusual survey. We worked through the NMC membership and got almost 500 people, including faculty, staff, administrators, to answer questions about their sense of the definitions of digital literacy, their examples, how digital literacy plays out at their institution. And these institutions were quite varied, with everything from community colleges to research universities, libraries, museums, and the report covered a pretty wide range, and we found a few things. One was that there wasn't a commonly accepted definition. Um, another was that whereas most people felt that a kind of consumption-oriented form of digital literacy was prevalent, a production-oriented one was less so. We took a lot of frameworks that were in play at the time, we interviewed some leading experts, and we came up with a three-form definition or framework for where we think digital literacy can actually work. Uh, one key part of it uh, is a sense of what we call universal literacy, that is, literacy that everybody could be something to have. And that's a very basic familiarity with basic digital tools, everything from web authoring to the cloud, to office productivity tools, and especially to finding and assessing information online. Then we included, we added to the idea of creative literacy. And that's kind of literacy plus or universal literacy 2.0. That's literacy that includes more challenging technologies such as video or audio production, but also includes significant emphasis on production. And along with that, not just the skills, but also some of the issues that come with it, such as copyright knowledge. And we didn't think that would be universal. We thought that would apply to 
individuals at certain points in their careers, certain points in their development, uh, and depending on their fields. We also offered a third framework, which was thinking about digital literacy in different disciplines. So taking a look at which departments, which fields would have an emphasis on which technologies. So for example, thinking about say statistical software and mapping software, which would be very, very important for political science, as opposed to taking a look at say, uh, the text analysis, which would be more useful in literature versus the knowledge of programming computer science. We concluded that report last year with some recommendations. Uh, the recommendations included urging anybody involved in digital literacy to look at strategic level implementations. A key reason for this was that we saw many, many pilots, in fact, many institutions, digital literacy equaled one person who was excited about it. We also urged people to think about students as makers, students as creators. And again, that wasn't the majority of practice that we found. We also urge people to build partnerships with other institutions, be they with the corporations or that were engaged in this kind of work, especially as they're looking at people getting ready to enter the workforce, but also with other institutions academically and in terms of cultural heritage. Now, in response to that, we launched a few different video conferences. We conducted more research. And this year, in part to take into account the feedback we got, we did a second brief, that's what we're announcing today. And we just break down how this worked with some of the issues and some of the findings. A key aspect of this is that we made this a very transnational research project. As you can see from the people involved in this call, uh, we have people here from uh, Sweden, from Britain, from the United States. Uh, we, in, we collected research into digital literacy practices throughout Europe, the Middle East, Africa, Canada, and the United States. And I think part of the delight part of the fascination of this was looking at not just the similarities, but the really strong differences that occur from different nations and from different regions. The differences include everything from relative degrees of emphasis on skills to the way they construe the person and how important personal power was. So the role of digital literacy in terms of national frameworks and policy. Now a key part of this, and again part of this is response to the changes in the overall global political phenomenon is that we took a look at, we increased our, our engagement with critical uh, and political engagement. That is thinking about digital literacy as part of analysis of power and inequality. And we found this not in all frameworks, but in more than a few. We also took a look at how digital literacy played out in a few different specific curricular positions. That is, we took a look at digital literacy programs in humanities, in business, in computer science, and also introductory courses in general education in general. And again, that was very interesting, seeing what tended to be emphasized, what tended to be focused on, and how that was different from discipline to discipline. Now, along with this, we added to the 2016 report in looking at still more frameworks, and the free frameworks everywhere from UNESCO, the Mozilla Foundation, to JISC, to individual uh, K through 12 programs in Canada and in the state of Massachusetts. And we're able to play that out by taking a look at different emphases. Again, you can just hear quickly from this chart, we looked at how different frameworks emphasize communication versus critical thinking, versus tech skills, versus content creation, versus civics and citizenship and copyright. And not all hit all of these in, different, in the same way. We also structured this report in a more expansive way by creating a splendid editorial board. And these editors did two major, major functions. One function was that they helped survey the report in progress. They worked in different drafts, taking a look at what we emphasized, taking a look at the issues that we came across, taking a look at our language, our research, and we had tremendous feedback from and second, every editor contributed pros to the report. So if you take a look at the report, the second to last section is a series of contributions from each of them. I just want to acknowledge them all by name. Uh, from the University of Adelaide in Australia, we had Judith Bailey and uh, David Santarandra. We had Maha Bali from the American University of Cairo, and virtually connecting. And I want to single Maha out because she's been one of the most energetic collaborators, contributing a great deal, adding content, giving us feedback, just definitely a terrific collaborator. We had Stephen Bell from Temple University Libraries. We had Johan Bergstrom from Ume University in Sweden, who is also one of our panelists. We had Cheryl Brown from the University of Cape Town, who is also here right now. Hello, Cheryl. We had Michael Caulfield from Washington State University. Again, someone we're really, really proud to work with because he's become one of the bright emerging voices in this field. 
with Lisa Janica Hinchcliffe from the uh, University of Illinois. Again, a major player in the role of information literacy, a great contributor to this. We have Joan Lippincott from CNI, uh, another major, major player in the information literacy. We have Courtney Miller from the University of Southern California, and Joyce Ogborn from Appalachian State University. Again, this is really a collaborative effort, and I really want to, say, I want to give every one of these people a shout out and my praise and my congratulations for their work. Now, you can simply download the report and dive into it right now if you'd like, but I'd like to take some time and just dwell on some of the key findings and some of the key issues that came up. Uh, so briefly, one of them was that most of the 2016 findings we found persisted. Our threefold definition was still useful. Uh, our distinction between learner as consumer and learner as producer still of help and still a major, major issue. Uh, we also found that people were emphasizing citizenship and civic engagement and social engagement in really different ways. And that could range from a framework or a digital literacy program that encouraged learners to become great workers. Uh, we found that to be a special case in uh, many African frameworks. Uh, or it could be one that encouraged students to become participants in their local uh, political environment or their institutional environment. And we found that in part in the United States. Uh, at times, the civic engagement was more formal and built into regulation. We found this through uh, primary and secondary frameworks and also in quite a few European ones. Now, we also found some interesting differences um, in a few other ways. One was that few frameworks strongly emphasized digital tools per se. That is, they rarely broke down individual software packages that students had to learn. They rarely emphasized hardware that students had to learn. And many times, the requirements or the recommendations were more general, such as web publishing rather than WordPress, and say video editing rather than say iMovie. Um, and what technologies were recommended really, really different uh, from, from person to person. Speaking of personal, we also found a wide range of, of approaches to the individual learner, the individual quester after information, the individual maker of content. So in some cases, like in the American frameworks, we found a strong emphasis on the learner as someone who's going through an experience of personal growth and development, so almost a therapeutic language. And again, in Africa, the contrast was more professional, that you would get digital literacy skills in order to become a better worker, uh, to improve your chances of either being an entrepreneur or landing a job somewhere. Um, in other cases, the personal wasn't really emphasized as such. So that's an interesting dynamic to have. Um, now, at the very end of the report, we have this series of wonderful contributions from the editors. And then I was asked to talk about the future of where digital literacy could go. And I just want to highlight a few key points of this and where I think this could be going. One was I recommended that we take a look at individual emerging technologies to see how digital literacy could play a role. So for example, we want to think about, say, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. So to what extent are people consuming information presented that way? Will a learner who wants to get information about a political candidate be taking a look at a VR level? Will a learner who wants to produce content, when will they turn to making an augmented reality item or experience? And we had to figure out ways that digital literacy applies there. We have to take that whole heritage Digital literacy, remember, again, includes information literacy as well as media literacy. And to see how all that combines when approaching VR, AR, and MR. We also want to think about some other technologies that are emerging that we aren't quite sure where they're going. So we think about blockchain technology. I'm not referring to Bitcoin per se. I'm referring to the different tools that can be built on top of blockchain. So you think about projects like Library or Ethereum and wonder again, will we have students should we address frameworks to include blockchain? When will students be going after blockchain-based content in order to find information? Where will they be sharing information via blockchain? How does that change? Uh, then we had two large, large themes uh, far beyond the individual technologies. One was the question of automation. So will automation impact the shape of digital literacy? So think about this in a few ways. Think about intelligent assistance. So to what extent should digital literacy frameworks encourage students, encourage learners to use 
bots to help them find material? And to what extent must we help train students and educate students in how automation is shaping this universe? I mean, we already know that some proportion, for example, of Twitter content is generated by bots. How does that shape our understanding of finding information on Twitter and sharing information on Twitter? We can go even still further. Uh, last year, the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation purchased the company Meta. Meta is a tool which is trying to add as much automation as possible to medical research and the health sciences scholarly record. If a student then is going to be looking at information about health sciences, to what extent do they have to bear in mind the impact of meta once again on world health? Should we train students to be using tools like that to better apprehend uh, different information that's presented and infected by automation? So that's one huge topic to think about. And the second is, uh, for lack of a better term, the increasing complexification of the political and social environment. That is, we're seeing the rise of troll armies, be they 4chan or Gamergate, that are creating an abusive environment, especially for marginalized populations worldwide. And to what extent is the rise of fake news, which again is partly driven by politics and partly powered by technology. How do we shape digital literacy to address that? And that's a, that's a major, major problem. That's the matrix in which we spin. That's the field in which we try to find and make information. So we have to bear these in mind as we try and think about the future of uh, digital literacy. Um, I, I think uh, to, to wrap this up, this was a collaborative process. Uh, we engaged a great number of people. We had the editors. We had the terrific NMC staff. I'm going to give them all a shout out here. Uh, Samantha. Uh, Becker was a tremendous engine in organizing and arranging information and creating information, getting all this together. Courtney then picked this up in the summer and helped see this across the finish line. Uh, we had wonderful support from people like Alex right here, uh, who helped set up the video conference that we're doing right now. And I want to give those people a shout out because it's really important to recognize the work they've done, which is not often appreciated. But when we say this is an NMC report, NMC staff did a lot of work. But also, when we think about digital literacy, this process that we went through involving dozens of people in their work and hundreds beyond that in our research, taking a look, be it through interviews or polling or using social media, emphasize that this is a social progress. This is a social practice. That digital literacy is not necessarily the case of an individual learner face to face of a wall of information. That this is a social process involving multiple people. And we really have to think deeply about what digital literacy means once we take this social seriously. Now, speaking of the social, let me step back for a minute. We have wonderful panelists here uh, who have each contributed greatly to this project. And I'd like to give each of them a turn to shoot their thoughts and ideas. Now, you all have questions, I'm sure, and I really want to hear from everybody about what questions they have and how they're uh, different what comments they have, what thinking they have about this. And I want to make sure that we can get all of this. Um, so, but please hold those questions for now until the panelists get to go. So, to begin with, um, I'm going to go in a totally random order. That is to say, I'm going to begin with Karen McKevin, uh, who is from uh, Adobe. And I want to give Adobe a major, major shout out. Because Adobe, we haven't said this so far, Adobe contributed immensely to the funding and support of this project. We're very, very grateful to them. Uh, they helped fund and support it last year, and they funded it this year, and we really couldn't do it without them. So thank you. But Karen, why don't you take a few minutes and tell us about what your thoughts are about the Digital Literacy Report and Digital Literacy. Sure, happy to, Brian. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you wanted to go through a couple of the slides that um, I had prepared if you wanted to do that now or if you wanted to do that later. Do you have a copy of those slides yourself? I do, but I, I thought Alex was going to load those. I'm not sure. But yeah, I'll certainly load those. I have those uh, ready to go, actually. Great. There are two slides, right, Karen? So, it's just why don't you, yeah, yeah. Why, don't you, why don't you pop those up and then, Karen, you can speak over them. Um, great. And so, yeah. Um, the reason, again, you know, Adobe sponsored the, the first um, a digital literacy strategic brief, which um, was, I think, a really great piece to start to help to um, broaden that conversation around the definition of digital literacy. We've got a lot of people very interested in that content. Um, and so 
what I, we wanted to do was sponsor it again and really um, see if we could get some, like Brian said, some broader uh, definitions, um, information more from some of the other regions, start to look at some of the disciplines. And the reason that Adobe is very interested in this is because, you know, Adobe's been very committed to education for really since the beginning of Adobe. And our mission is to actually um, inspire and empower the next generation to be lifelong creators. We have a whole group of people at Adobe that are 100% committed to education and the marketing and the, the um, positioning of um, uh, Adobe and what we can do to help um, the education um, segment. So let's advance to the next slide. Um, and I just wanted to share a couple little things about what we've seen too. We, we recently did a research survey our, ourselves uh, amongst Gen Z. And um, it, this is was a group that was the age of 13 to 17 as well as teachers of that age group. We wanted to find out from them how they were feeling about their education, about their future. And what we heard from them is, you know, they feel like they're very smart. 63% felt like they were smart. You know, again, technology is very native to them. So they feel comfortable with technology. They're very, uh, consider themselves creative and very hardworking. We go to the next slide. You know, we also asked them about um, what their future, what their future really was going to be. And students felt that, you know, they, they really feel that they're going to have to be creating as they go out into the marketplace, into their career. That's got to be a part of the skill set that they have to succeed. And teachers also felt, and of course this came out in the report um, that Brian just talked about, you know, Jen, Z uh, students are going to be in the marketplace in, in, in jobs and careers that we don't even know yet um, what those jobs will be. And one of the statistics I love is you think about those incoming students, you know, they're going to be retiring in the year, say, 2060. We don't even know what those careers will be. So I think what this report is also saying is some of those soft skills that students need to have. So if we go to the next slide. So one of the things that the report talked about um, was just this whole evolution that uh, students go through when they truly um, use uh, technology and their creative minds with collaboration. They become true storytellers. And when they go through this in creating something new, there's actually an improved understanding of the subject matter. And we're seeing that time and time again with a lot of the institutions that we're working with. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And so together, when they work collaboratively with other students, they're actually producing new content that never even existed before. Again, deeper understanding of that subject matter. Again, the report talks about that a lot. And if we go to the next slide. So what we're seeing at Adobe is we've partnered with a number of schools around their digital literacy initiatives as they're looking at the areas where they can start to influence um, digital literacy across uh, across the, the campus, across the classroom, across the curricula. And so they're doing things like ensuring that there's, you know, student portfolios, they're working on transforming learning spaces, and actually taking teaching and learning to the next level by incorporating some of Adobe's creative cloud tools into the curricula. So we run to the next slide. Just a couple of the examples of schools that have been partnering with Adobe in this way. And these are just a couple of examples of schools that have really um, embraced uh, the importance of ensuring that their students are digitally literate. And whether they have a 100% engagement initiative or an access and equity initiative or a full-on digital literacy initiative, they're really looking at how they can transform teaching and learning and again, they've partnered with Adobe, and they are um, having um, working with their faculty, working with Adobe, uh, with us and the education team, to incorporate Creative Cloud into what we sort of think about our, our non-creative um, you know, departments. Many people think of Adobe, and we think of art and design departments. But what we're seeing is momentum around Creative Cloud being incorporated into humanities, English, sciences, many other disciplines 
in an effort to help students learn those digital literacy skills, be able to create new content, be more engaged in the, uh, the, the coursework, and again, deeper understanding of the subject matter. Um, and so these are a couple of schools that have um, really embraced this partnership with Adobe and are um, expanding the use of our tools across the campus, across the student body. So if we go to the next school, or the next slide, of course, Adobe, like I said, you know, we have been committed to education for a very long time, and we have a lot of uh, resources, a lot of content that's available to help faculty, to help administrators, to actually incorporate Creative Cloud into your curricula in an easy way. Um, so if you're new, say you're a science uh, faculty member, and you've never maybe used Creative Cloud, we've got a lot of content that's actually being, out, being built out by faculty for faculty on how to incorporate um, projects using some of the Creative Cloud tools into their coursework to be able to create uh, and assign um, digital media projects to their students. So we've got a, a, a site called um, Adobe's Education Exchange, and that's packed full of resources for faculty and teachers with um, professional development, with teaching modules, with um, examples of student work, and I've got the URL here at the bottom. Um, this area of Adobe for Academics is really specific to some of those schools that I highlighted that are, again, really embracing Creative Cloud um, beyond your typical art and design departments to really, again, broaden students' um, digital literacy um, knowledge and, um, and experience. And again, just lots of other content and resources we have available to help faculty, to help administrators. Thank you so much. Oh, sure. please. Yeah. No, that's it. That's, that was really it. Um, so, so really, that's, that's why Adobe is very interested in this. Again, we are committed to education. We are committed to supporting the, the broader education um, community and really want to um, help facilitate um, the um, curricula, maker spaces, really partnering with a number of different schools that have um, very similar goals. So thank you. Thank you very much. And, and again, uh, please, um, everyone, we uh, have time for questions right after this panel. So hold your questions for Karen and until after we have more people to speak. Uh, so speaking of more people, uh, let's cut to the uh, frozen north. Although actually, Johan, I bet you're enjoying a wonderful uh, summer right now. Um, Johan, what's, what are your thoughts about this, uh, about this report and about digital literacy in 2017? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I represent the whole, whole Scandinavian area, apparently. Uh, so I speak for all of us. Uh, Very good. Yeah. No, uh, I mean, I'm, um, I think that my view of it is, I hear that there are a lot of uh, discussions about creation. Uh, creating uh, together. And my view is that rather than living, um, I would say that the most important uh, aspect is co-creation and the aspect of co-creation between the between students, uh, but also between faculty and students. Uh, the classic view is that uh, everyone is really, uh, all the students are really techie savvy and uh, they are digital natives, but my view is being a father of three boys, um, they're not only techie savvy, they're also very digital naive. Mm -hmm. They have all the tools and have all the, uh, the skills, but they don't know what to do with them. And that's where I think that most um, uh, universities and faculty can help out, uh, steering, steering uh, uh, students in a way that, because I don't, I don't think it's possible for any university or any faculty member to keep up with the, the technology, the technological development, which is, I mean, I don't see that happening. So it's, in my view, it's more about um, ensuring what I think is the future of higher education in general, uh, the, the goal of learning to learn rather than learn, learning a specific skill. But that's perhaps further on for what, 2060, was that the year we're aiming for? Yeah, yeah. Maybe so, or maybe uh, 2019. Um, so, 
<laughs> so that, that's my very, very broad thoughts on, on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna follow up with you uh, on that um, after uh, everyone else has their turn. Uh, Cheryl, um, you need to unmute so I can introduce you. And by the way, did I, did I misplace you um, by the wrong half of the planet? Did I put you in Britain instead of South Africa? My apologies. <laughs> It's fine. I'm sure you said I was from Africa. And like Johan, I was worried about representing an entire continent. Um. <laughs> you, you know, we Americans have never had a problem with that. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> Thank goodness in our report, we've got some other African colleagues, as you referenced, Maha. So um, it's not just me. But I think um, from my point of view, I mean, we still see a huge discrepancy in terms of access to um, ICTs. And um, that really impacts um, on our whole education sector. I mean, I think I said this in the, in the first webinar that we had. So, um, you know, I think when we see that a students are able to access and have um, technology for learning and they have the ability to, um, to participate in um, the information economy, we're very excited. Uh, but some of the research that we've done and I've done with colleagues um, in South Africa has shown that really most students are able to consume knowledge. It's exactly what Karen said. People are able to find, you know, they get the digital literacies to find the information they need um, to connect with people, um, to participate, I think, in terms of social media. But what they don't do, what very few do, is um, actually start to contribute their knowledge and interests into the, into the global space. And if I think in our report, We've got a, um, a Wikimedia um, sort of map that shows just what the global south and global north inequities are in terms of the contribution of knowledge. And we find, um, you know, we have to do very actively encourage students to feel confident to, to go out there and participate and create and share. The... Um, the one research, bit of research that we did do um, showed very few students doing this, but those students that did had an absolute edge in terms of their employment um, afterwards. So it again touches on what Karen was saying, that this is absolutely a critical skill for the global marketplace, and it gave them such an edge. What was interesting is that they were doing this all off their own bat. They were doing this as part of the informal learning. They were seeking out the opportunities to engage, contribute, and collaborate. This wasn't part of their curriculum. This wasn't part of pedagogy. And I think one of the things that we need to challenge ourselves in education to do as teachers is not be scared to push our students out there and to say to them, it's okay to engage with other people. It's not me as the expert. It's okay to engage with you know, other students and that this ability to, to create and learn in informal and other connected networks is, is a very valuable attribute and is in fact what's going to happen when they're in the workplace. So, I mean, I think for me, one of the things I tell our lecturers now is you need to open up your space. You need to um, not be scared of bringing bringing other people in and getting your students to go out and share. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you so much for adding so many key points, uh, especially at the very end, point about informal education and the uh, point about differential and uh, inequitous uh, access. Thank you so much. Um, now, let's see here. I think that brings us to the end of our panel. Um, and then that brings us to the beginning for everyone here. This is the contribution time where everyone gets to discuss and share their thoughts about everything that's just been said. Uh, so I have a few questions to stir the pot, um, but I want to make sure that everybody in the audience from uh, Liz Neely to George Station, um, Sarah and Doug, uh, Michael Berman, Catherine Galway gets a chance to ask their questions. Uh, so please, um, the uh, chat box is standing by ready for you. Uh, the question I'd like to begin with um, to ask everybody here is if you could think about the join between these three different pieces. So we have the heritage of media literacy. And again, we found that to be really playing a role in a lot of Middle Eastern uh, frameworks. And that media literacy goes back to the 60s and 70s. So we have that piece. We have the information literacy piece, which dates back to the 80s, uh, comes largely from the library world. And now we have the digital literacy framework, which, which encompasses both of them, but also adds a lot more. So if you could speak about that, that join, I mean, how do you see that playing out? Is this a happy synthesis? Do you see rising interest in media literacy? Um, do you think that we are underplaying information literacy? What do you think about that combination? 
I could, I could, <laughs> I could, I, well, somehow I, I understand that there is a, there is a need to define this, um, uh, this whole concept. I'm going to, maybe I'm going to kill the discussion here, but basically I think that uh, the digital literacy uh, is more of a tool, a means to an end rather than the, the challenge that, that needs be. I mean, somehow you can discuss who is responsible for, for getting up to a level of digital literacy. Is it the university? Is it the student themselves? Just as Cheryl commented, that the students themselves took charge in, in, what, to, what, in what way to, to uh, uh, attack the, di the digital illiteracy. Uh, but also, I think it's it's important to to recognize that that it's it's a tool rather than the end goal. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. I don't think that kills it. Um, I think it's important and <laughs> uh, brings us to the question of uh, tools. Um, Karen, uh, Cheryl, did you want to add to that? Um, I think from my point of view, it's quite interesting is that often the support and um, sort of, I don't know, the home of these different literacies is in different locations. So information literacy, as we said, still sits very much in the library sector. And I find it really odd that students get taught information literacy in one place, and then they're meant to go somewhere else for academic literacies, you know, how do you read and write, and then they must go somewhere else for the digital. And that to me seems um, like a really bit of a mismatch. I mean, how, if you are trying to learn these skills, how do you even know that the problem you have is is digital or writing or about you know critically assessing information and I, I think the fact that we don't think about these holistically often or that we do as sort of thought leaders in the area but our institutions don't you know sort of suggests there's an awful lot that institutions and policymakers need to take on board from this report in terms of thinking about how to integrate this so that um, this is not something that you know, students are all move from one place to another in order to um, to sort of build a suite of of skills that they can attributes that they're going to need. Oh, that's a, that's well said. Um, I don't know, um, Cheryl, if you can see the uh, chat box, but uh, Sarah um, agrees. She says she's still siloed in a lot of people's minds um, during a pilot project where we shifted data collection of student labs to a tablet rather than paper sheet. Um, one comment was, "We're sacrificing content for technology." Uh, they didn't see their fast as the same scientific skill sets. Uh, that's a really important point. And it may be, just, just looking ahead, it may be that we're still in the early days of the synthesis trying to bring this all together. Um, and we, we need a lot more growth. I'm going to come back to that. Um, but we had a question from uh, Michael Berman, uh, who wanted to know what he thought of the, were the major differences uh, between uh, different nations' um, uh, frameworks for digital literacy. So uh, I have a couple of thoughts, but I'm just wondering if um, Cheryl, uh, Johan, or uh, Karen, if you'd like to add uh, what you saw. I don't know that, I'm, I think diving back to the report might be good. I mean, personally, I found the case studies that we had from the various contributors we all came at it from a different angle and I haven't sort of gone through it enough to say, to say did something different. Like I almost found from my perspective, I found there was an awful lot in the report that talked back to me. So I'm not sure that I would say there were lots of differences in the geographic reason in the regions, but I haven't actually sat through and tried to pick out something that seemed, you know, like it was a disjuncture. So um, yes, I mean, I would almost say I'd have to analyze the report to see what there were differences, but I found a lot of synergies. So even though it wasn't my story necessarily, it was, um, you know, I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's a similar challenge or that's a nice approach that would work in this context. Well, good. That's a very optimistic way of looking at it. Um, I, I mentioned a couple of differences that I observed uh, in the course of making this report. I'll just uh, want to emphasize or add a couple. Um, a lot of European frameworks were very uh, state driven, uh, either by the individual nation state or by a larger European project. And that often constituted how people would approach them. So you would learn digital literacy because it fit into this framework, it fit into this national agenda, or it fit into this uh, European Commission or European Union, I think. Um, and I find that to be unusual. Um, a lot of other uh, places would have the uh, frameworks be much more locally oriented. Uh, the United States, for example, we have very disintegrated, uh, very locally driven, very autonomous education system. So a lot of the uh, frameworks are based on uh, individual departments or individual people. Um, 
Whereas if you uh, if you look at some from uh, uh, the Middle East, I think one of the interesting differences there was that many of them emphasized media literacy um, more than I think any other region. So that's a great question. Uh, we had uh, another question um, that came in uh, from, uh, let's see if I can get uh, George, I think it's George Station, um, who asked if we could say more about the influence of social versus the classic individual approach to digital literacy. Uh, I heard the downsides, fake news, gaming, world troll, armies, women, bots. How about the upside? Connectivism. What else? So, uh, Johan, do you want to take a whack at that? Because you were talking about the um, social and collaborative aspect. Um, on mute there we go yes. uh, well I, I'm trying to find the question here uh, okay the upsides well I, I think that my view of, of collaborative um, and co-creation is, is more about not as much about let's say <laughs> writing writing a, a blog together or working in a in a project uh, uh, project space or whatever, it's more about uh, living the digital. Uh, you, were, you were speaking about uh, how the digital literacy is driven, and I would say that in Sweden, for instance, it's very it, publicly driven. There is a, an agenda, uh, which encompasses every aspect of, of the public uh, space, from, from um, uh, tax, <laughs> taxes to higher education. Uh, even though it's up to each university to to define what they need to do, but my view of, of co-creation is rather the uh, rather thinking about how to actually yourself as a student be part of something very tangible, uh, creating something that you can use yourself and your in your studies or your everyday life together with other students together uh, with faculty. Uh, and and I, that's perhaps a big, uh, a big challenge, obviously. But my um, my my personal uh, goal or thoughts are about creating a framework of of a um, uh, projects where you can actually produce uh, results uh, together, cross disciplinary, also not only not only uh, between faculty within a, within a specific subject, but also, as you mentioned before, business to humanities to uh, psychology, for instance, and have all these aspects uh, uh, be, be, um, be used in something that can be, that students themselves uh, will have in their everyday life. That's a, that's a really, really rich answer, especially your emphasis on tangible products. Mm. Students ending up with something that they can take away. I mean, maybe literally tangible, I think, like 3D printing, for example, uh, yeah. a DVD uh, print, or at least a, a digital project. We have more questions that should, the chat box has just opened up. Uh, I want to come, uh, Mark asks, um, he gives a bit of his background. I want to, you could read the whole thing, but it's very detailed. In the interest of time, I want to get to his question. He's a, a self taught person, an autodict type. And he wants to know how the educated class that has given us the current educational, economic, political, and medical care crises can be so condescending. So he describes that he wants to be a self-taught learner. He is a self-taught learner, um, but he is getting a lot of pushback for doing that. Um, so how can the educated class that has given us uh, so many problems can also be so condescending to uh, uh, self-taught learners, to all the that's a good question. Uh, I just take a, a really quick answer, which is uh, that uh, if, if, to the extent that nations believe in meritocracy, they believe that those who are at the very top are dropped not only because they deserve it based on their intelligence, their skills, their training, and so on. So that gives them an awful lot of pride. Uh, and that can lead to condescension. Uh, Karen, Cheryl, Johan, did you want to take a look at that? I was just going to type that it was a good question, but that was a hard question. <laughs> um, and I'm much, I mean, I think there's quite a lot in the report about the characteristics of the digit of the new digital learner. Um, not so much the skills, but what sort of person we think 
we think our young generation has to be in the digital age and the sort of stuff that we have on digital citizenship and um, the, the way people should behave online. I mean, to some extent, it's almost like the online space has surfaced the horrors of what people are thinking about and talking about, you know, sort of behind mm. closed doors types of things. Mm. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think that's, I'm, I don't know that there's an answer, um, but I think it's about, it's about practice and behavior. I suppose when email first came out and we used to have those rules that our IT departments send round about what you were and weren't allowed to do and, you know, the, the protocols of behaving online. I almost think now in the, in the digital social world where we're trying to collaborate and open things up, we need the same thing for, for people, adults and young people alike. Um, I mean, I think, Current politics is just, yeah, you're right, Liz, digital etiquette. Current politics is just showing the absolute flaw everywhere in the world in terms of um, the, way, the way people and how they, who they open doors to and who they close doors to and who they accept and who they don't. I don't know about the answer, but it's a, I think it's a very frightening thing. I mean, I think we have to do this online behavior as, a, as quite an important part of being digital. I think you're right. Um, and that's a really good, good response. And you'll find Mark has a genius for asking very, very deep questions. Uh, uh, we have a question uh, as well from uh, Anonymous. Uh, let me just read this quickly. I work, from, I work with the Ohio State University Extension. and We are in the process of developing digital education competencies for our staff, many of whom are not digital natives. I'm excited to get a report, but I'm wondering if you can speak to us how we can ensure our faculty and staff best prepared, and perhaps more so, open to and accepting of digital literacy and digital content development. Cooperative Extension is focused on community education. We have presence in every county throughout the nation. We know we can deepen and broaden community impact through innovative teaching and learning methods, but how can we best encourage and prepare faculty and staff to become digitally literate? That's a great question, Anonymous. You know, I can talk a little bit about that, Brian. Please, just to, please. To, Schools that have partnered with Adobe um, in support of their digital literacy initiatives, again, around uh, using Creative Cloud in a broader um, departments. What we're hearing from them is that by uh, working with faculty and providing faculty with very easy to implement um, teaching modules that allow students to say, easily create, say, an infographic, or create a movie, or maybe create a podcast. Um, we have other faculty from the schools that we've partnered with that have been creating these modules and are sharing them on our Adobe for um, uh, Academic site that I had mentioned within our Education Exchange. And those modules consist of um, teaching modules, they consist of how to assess, and um, the rubrics around the assessment, um, that seems to be one of the big questions is how do you actually assess digital literacy skills versus the content? And we have a lot of content that we currently have on our site about that and that we're building out with our various um, partners. Actually, I should say Adobe's not building it out. We are um, providing a space for faculty to share that information. Um, and so, we're seeing that when, when there are, uh, you know, a, a, a very strong advocate for digital literacy on the campus, they can help to broaden that um, effort across the campus and leverage tools that were making it, making it much more easy for faculty to start incorporating these things, um, you know, including things like sample student, uh, student work, you know, it kind of walking people through the kinds of uh, assignments that they could easily um, incorporate um, some of the Creative Cloud skills. So that's, that's an area that we've seen some real success with. Well, thank you. Um, that's a really positive answer. Uh, and you'll see if you take a look through the chat box that professional development has been surfacing as a major, major topic. Uh, people are really concerned with that. So, um, uh, Cheryl, you want, if you want to circle back to that uh, in a few minutes, um, please feel free to. Um, we have a comment from Joyce Ogburn. I want to bring draw attention to that because Joyce is one of those awesome panelists, and Joyce is just an awesome person in general. Uh, and she uh, wanted to second Cheryl's point of view about uh, the holistic approach and references the ACRL uh, framework, which is a key part. 
another question that we have uh, is from Eric Trimble, who asks if we have any recommendations for universities that are just getting started with digital literacy in terms of the holistic approach that he adds, i.e., what groups tend to be the most enthusiastic stakeholders? That's a great question, Eric. I'll just mention librarians right off the bat. But how about the rest of you? You know, Cheryl, uh, Karen, who else gets to be the cheerleaders that help drive digital literacy into holistic stat? I, mean, I agree with librarians. I think part of that thing that we were just talking about in terms of silos, I think just getting everybody in a room together to figure out that they're not talking such different language. I mean, I think the problem of all these literacies having developed in separate disciplines is that people think that in, they think that they, they're talking a different language, but they're not really. So, I mean, I think getting, I mean, we've had success in just getting, um, you know, a library colleague, an academic literacies colleague, an academic and students just to find out what people mean and think about. And then it sort of demystifies um, some of the academic jargon as well. And we find it works really quite well. But I think also when we're talking about champions on campus, having pilot projects um, where we perhaps integrate something into a course and we've got some extra support for the faculty involved helps develop their confidence and also helps become a model for other faculty members in the future. So that's another strategy to um, just sort of try and get some things up and running on a very small um, sort of low risk kind of um, scale on a campus and then have them work out in the communities of practice that others have been suggesting in the chat. Low risk really, really counts. That's very, very good. Thank you. Uh, Johan, please continue. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say, I mean, this is, again, if you want the, the champion, champion approach, I understand that's, a, that's a, I would say, an easy win, or the, but, but to, to, to make a real change at, at a university level, you need to have a holistic approach. I, I, I feel that somehow, sometimes the champion uh, approach will create silos themselves. It's going to be a specific department or a specific uh, uh, group of staff that will have, have that, that role and uh, exclude um, other roles. Uh, again, again, I think that uh, uh, my view of, of, of creating a cross-disciplinary uh, pilot project, you mentioned pilot, uh, Cheryl, uh, would perhaps uh, tie together different parts of, of faculty, different parts of, of the university uh, to, to view it um, as a whole. Uh, pilot projects are excellent because if they crash and burn, they're just pilots. Um, and, uh, and, and if they succeed, wow, they're the first step in a long, positive trip. Um, just, just draw your attention, friends, to the, uh, the chat box, which is really taking off. And a few people have added a few other points. Uh, Sarah and Doug uh, from Colby University have added that instructional the technologists, instructional designers are also great champions. Uh, we had a nice exchange with Mark uh, about student uh, panelists. Uh, George Station is continuing a good conversation about digital etiquette and what that means now, uh, linking back to uh, panelist Mahabali. Um, and uh, Joyce uh, Ogburn uh, emphasizes that the, these interest groups can be informal as well as formal. Uh, we have a few other questions here, and I'm conscious about time. Uh, I just want to draw attention to a couple of more observations that are really powerful. Maya Grigeva mentions that uh, the EU and UNESCO have been working on digital literacy for years. Um, it has a positive and negative impact. The positive is that it got the administrative part of education early on, but not so exciting part is that it left teachers and students out of the conversation for years. Now we have a bottom-up approach. I think that's a very, very good way of describing uh, how this is going. Um, we also have uh, people seconding the segregation between digital and formal literacy and how that's a real challenge uh, and an issue that we really need to be concerned about. Uh, again, this really seems like it should be a very major uh, strategic interest for, for campuses. Uh, and just personally, I think this is where the panic over and the anxiety over fake news really comes uh, into, into play. I think a lot of people are now interested in and supporting digital literacy who didn't know they were before. Uh, we have a great question from Karen Nagawe, who says, selfishly, as I'm a doc of the EDU, great question though, is anyone addressing accessibility in 508, WCAG, and any of this? Should accessibility be considered part of digital literacy as a form of access? Okay, who wants to tackle accessibility? Karen, Cheryl, do you want? I mean, I think the, the answer is it's, um, 
it's not as um, in the forefront as it near people's thoughts as it needs to be. I think we tend to feel relaxed sometimes by the fact that um, we think our you know our learning management systems have got you know alternative options and choices and we think we have support systems in place i think i was saying to somebody the other day it's still something students with students with disabilities they need to go find the support the support doesn't come to them see gordon's telling us we've got a very very little bit of time left um yes i mean i we really we really ought to we really ought to push it up there i think the only thing i can say about accessibility is the more multimodal and media orientated we are the more we draw in video and all audio and text and everything together in, in the teaching and learning package, the, the more students we're likely to reach. And so I think that's one of the, the very easy ways that we can do that. That's a good answer. That's a really good answer. Um, and Karen appreciates us and thanks her. Uh, you can see that we have a more discussion, people following up on that uh, with uh, questions of accessibility. Uh, we also have more language questions. Uh, about questions of digital citizenship versus digital literacy, digital fluency versus literacy. Um, and then we've had several other editors have weighed in. Stephen Bell from Temple University is talking about his cross info lit teams, which is going to get cross fit in some ways. Um, and we also have a uh, Dana or Danae Wolf uh, has followed up with questions about cooperative education. And she raises a really, really powerful point uh, about how there's a difference between educating learners in a formal education environment, especially for traditional age undergraduates, 18 to 22 year olds, versus educating the entire world. Uh, everybody, every adult learner can come in. We think of the Open University in the UK, and we think about the role that public libraries play in having to render access to and train anybody who walks in, uh, which is very, very powerful. Friends, we're at the two minute stop, uh, where we're gonna have to respect your time and uh, let you all go back to your lives. Um, before I turn the uh, mic over to uh, Alex, I just want to say, first, thank you all so much for a fantastic conversation. This is one of the most delightful panels I've ever had the pleasure to work with. And everybody on the chat has just had a torrent of observations and questions that are imaginative, provocative, and drawing a wide variety of experience. So I want to thank all of you for this conversation. And then once again, at the risk of repetition, I want to thank everybody involved in producing this report from the great NMC staff to the editorial board to everyone else who helped out. Thank you very much. Now, over to you, Alex. All right, great. Uh, to wrap up today's program, I want to thank uh, Brian, Karen, Yuan, and Cheryl on behalf of the NMC for taking time to chat about this latest NMC strategic brief. Um, in the uh, chat, I'm going to put in a couple um, links. So once again, be sure to download a, your free copy of this latest NMC publication at that link. And participants, if you want more information about anything you saw or heard today, let, let us know by contact, contacting me directly at alex at nmc.org. Learn, learn more about future NMC online programs and get involved in our online com in our community be, by becoming a member. Uh, learn more about NMC memberships at go.nmc.org slash members. Um, until our next program, I want to thank you for joining us today and thank everyone for uh, this great discussion. We'll see you next time.